So, uh, the subject of this uh, is human capital. Now, in a way, this is very good, because of at least two reasons. Second, much more about human capital you already heard, and you will hear, from Zbigniew, who is an economist, and so whatever he say, has to say will be much more to the point, and so on. So this considerably facilitates what I want to say. Number two, uh, Gary and I published uh, several articles. One of them was uh, dealing with the subject of the human capital. One of them has actually the title, Human Capital and the Sustainable Development. And this has been published in the journal Sustainability. So again, I will very heavily draw on that. And then, uh, in few cases, there are several other articles in uh, Cadmus dealing with this. So rather than spending time on this thing, which you better can read directly or hear in a better version from uh, from uh, Zbig, uh, let me concentrate on certain aspects of discussions. Okay, first is a general definition of the capital and the general definition of what do I mean by human development. By capital is actually any usable productive resource all forms of assets capabilities, that can be harnessed for human development. If it is not harnessed for human development, then it is not capital. Okay? Now, Adam Smith, of course, uh, addressed that question, and he was speaking in details about land capital, building capital, machinery, human abilities, and so on. He was there already. What we will do is we will just aggregate and distinguish three capitals, natural capital, human capital, and human-made capital. This is all what are, all of the capitals are broken in these three categories, okay? And then the important statement, anything becomes a resource only when its potential is recognized by the human, either human being or human mind or, or whatever. Now, of course, you can ask how about air. Air is obviously a capital. Uh, and, of course, we recognize it as an important one each time we breathe. On the other hand, uh, a historic example of uh, a mining that was occurring not far from here, uh, actually in the present-day uh, Czech Republic, people were mining silver. And in the process of mining silver, they got some unpleasant ore, and that unpleasant ore was uh, something which is really what they did not like. And they call it pech blenda. Pech meaning, of course, something better, right? So that would stick to them, but they didn't like it, it was not silver, and so on. It turned out that that actually is an ore very rich in uranium and became very important today. So, is all but pet is very good when you get that, uh, that, that thing. So, uh, for Mises, who actually is viewed uh, as a conservative economist in many ways, and this is why I personally don't like this distinction of conservative and non-conservative, uh, stresses what's the most important thing. Economy is about people. People, not only one person, but people in general, and that is important. Uh, on the individuality, we have already several talks, uh, and let me just make one interesting comment uh, related to the Sputnik building. At the time when Sputnik was built, uh, of course it was the time of the Soviet Union, and there the tendency was that if it was not a contribution of one important great man by name, Josip Vissarionovich Stalin, then of course it is the people. So they claim that Soviet people made the Sputnik. In reality, of course, Sputnik was made by an engineer, a genius one, Karolyov, and when he disappeared from the picture because he was too old, uh, then of course others, it was really uh, quite... Uh, slow down in, uh, in uh, the development uh, of, uh, of the Sputniks. You have heard this already, so let me, let me uh, skip on that. And the important point here is that society now apparently exhibits the capacity to leave. 
so now this is something that we have this possibility that certain things which took later a long time now can actually be done that very, very uh, quickly. So now let me do something which is much, much simpler than that what is the world model 3 that uh, uh, Carl was talking about, uh, the famous Club of Rome report limits to growth. Let us look at the human capital. So rather than, uh, let me, okay, okay, say what is the situation over there, because uh, I did not want to take the time, uh, we, we did not have it too much time to discuss. Uh, uh, but Khan pointed out, actually, when we were looking into the anticipation, what a more enormous role was played by the book called Limits to Growth. Okay? Limits to Growth, let's immediately say that. This is prediction. Okay? This is prediction. So in that way, that is similar to, for instance, what uh, following Newton... Uh, Laplace, uh, Lagrange, and all these people did when they predicted the position of the planet as the planets move around the sun, okay? Except that there they had few variables, essentially a simple motion. They had a very known force, gravity, and they had known initial conditions. The problem that the MIT group led by Jay Forrester, and specifically led by Meadows and Meadows and uh, uh, several other guys, it, is, it was a considerably more complicated thing. Uh, but this is still a prediction. Now, the, rather than one equation, they had several equations. In both cases, there were linear equations. Now, the trouble when you make predictions, the trouble and the enormous advantage the thing which makes it science is that you can criticize it. There is something you can meaningfully criticize. When you are just uh, using your intuition, then okay, is your intuition, is my intuition, this is sort of something, you know, very different. So let's see when, what happens now with the human capital when uh, we try to do this thing. We will denote human capital by a capital letter Psi. We will then denote the natural capital, which includes ecosystem, air, water, and so on, by phi sub n, and we will denote the human-made capital by, again, phi, who is uh, the subscript agent, human-made. Okay? Now, what is influencing the human capital? and the development of human capital, obviously the presence of the human capital, this is obviously, one term would be proportional to the human capital, lambda psi, the other would be proportional maybe to some power of the human capital. But this is not all. What else you can have? You can have also some destructive effects, and you can have some positive effects as well. Positive effects would be the end of the Cold War. Destructive effect would be the Second World War, and something like that. So these things could be the effect. And so the equation, one equation that you get is the change in the human capital, this is d psi over dt, this is the change, is equal to the human capital, and then these positive and destructive effects. And then the effects due to the human capital by changing the natural capital and by changing the human-made capital. Obviously, if the human, if the natural capital is destroyed, then this term alpha times the change in the natural capital becomes negative and the human capital is decreasing. So obviously this is clear. If we destroy natural capital, you will be losing the, you will be losing uh, the human capital. Similarly, of course, for the human-made capital, if you destroy buildings, uh, infrastructure, and so on, by war, this is it. And then, of course, a general term that would be dependent on all of that. Okay, so this is the equation. And then you can, of course, if you have these questions, if you have these uh, constants, lambda, mu, gamma, alpha, beta, and so on, you could try to solve it, or you could actually do the following. And the plot that you will see is the plot that uh, Gary uh, made for this uh, uh, article that we published. 
And what do you see? You see, you see the plot of the population, which is this blue curve, which obviously goes exponentially, we know that. And then you see the world per capita GDP, which essentially tracks it. So it means that the GDP is, is increasing tremendously. Okay. Now, there are a couple of other things you see from here, though these are uh, scales where you have uh, 200 years interval, right? But you still don't see any pronounced wiggles. So the effect of uh, either positive or negative seems to be much smaller or obliterated somehow. So it seems that the driving force is really human capital itself that has something that physicists in the particle physics are called called calling bootstrapping. Now, to make bootstrapping mechanism familiar to all of you, let me, remind it, let me remind you that this is the mechanism of Baron Minhausen when he found himself in a big hole and then he takes himself for, uh, uh, grabs his shoes and lifts himself up. So bootstrapping is a mechanism where you, by your own energy, whatever it is, uh, unknown and clear, uh, bootstrap yourself uh, uh, in, uh, up, uh, uh, up in the something. So obviously human capital is this enormous force that we have, the greatest things that we have, and it has this, uh, this uh, uh, potential. So. This is its important thing. Now, as I said at the beginning, uh, let me just uh, uh, re-emphasize, under the term human capital, I have, uh, uh, sorry, Gary and I have included in this, for this purpose, also the social capital, also the cultural capital, uh, the intellectual, all of this is, is here. This is all what is pertaining to the, to the, to the human being. Now we turn to the other aspect. Now this other aspect became very famous very recently, as a matter of fact, uh, a year or more than Gary and I published this now two years ago, I think, well, <laughs> yeah, two and a half years ago. And uh, this year a book came out by uh, a man who became uh, suddenly very famous uh, by name Thomas Piketty. He is a French uh, economist and the title of his book uh, is uh, capital for the 21st century. And he is addressing the question of inequality. Uh, because of the title of the book and also because of his message, he is often referred to as a Marx of the 21st century and so on. So it's an interesting book. It's a huge volume where he addresses the data on inequality. Uh, the information about inequality that uh, we used here really come from a book by two British MDs, uh, Wilkinson and uh, I think Karen uh, Piquet, called Spirit Level, where they actually have shown that the larger inequality, the greater problems. Here it is, income inequality, if you have high income inequality, then you have worse index of health and social problems. And this, according to them, is true throughout. Now, looking into this question uh, in more details, actually, Gary and I argued that there is uh, a window of ideal inequality. We don't want to have complete equality. This is not good. Uh, and when, I, when I speak about inequality, I refer only to material inequality, not, of course, people are very, very unequal, they should be unequal, their the aspirations are unequal, but in terms of what they have, in terms of poverty and so on, it should not be, uh, there should be no such a thing. Last time I was speaking about values, and there is also some correlation between inequalities and values, and then you see those societies that highly value secular and rational approach usually have low inequalities and vice versa, those that don't, have huge inequality. Now, uh, so these are the problem of inequality, let me say here, has been done just in the framework of uh, this work of Wilkinson and Pickett. 
Now there is an enormous literature, not only uh, uh, Ricchetti, but also a gentleman by the name Milanovic, not the Prime Minister of Croatia, but a gentleman by the name Branko Milanovic, who is uh, one of uh, the important bank uh, associates. He published on that extensively. There is uh, uh, Mar Salai Martin, uh, another economist, and there are several views there. Of course, we won't go into this. One is the view which says that the tide lifts all the all the boats, and therefore that any kind of things is, is good. Uh, on the other hand, there is a view that too much inequality is very dangerous. Now, of course, just like in the question of the human capital, uh, there is, a, there is a big question also of inequality. Uh, you can be very, very rich, as some of the people are and have been, and as a result of them, there is an enormous uh, benefit to the entire human kind. There is no doubt in my mind that not only Gates and Warren Buffett, but also Carnegie's and Rockefeller's and so on, have done a number of good things. But there is also a lot of uh, inequality which turns out to be frozen and not active, and that's another of the big problem. But similarly, of course, when we come to the human capital, is a lot of, of, lot of problems, but let me go on and see now a few more things about that. that. Of course, let me just repeat that the study in biology by John Maynard Smith, where he applied the game theory, argued, and that was later on also shown by Axelrod, really finds in our evolution the basis of the famous golden rule. So one could view the golden rule as a God-imposed rule, or one can view it as something that God decided that he did not trust any of the sacred book, but decided to inscribe that in the human nature, and human nature, and similarly the nature of some of the animals, follow this famous Eskimo saying that the best place to store food is in another person's belly. So you really want to be altruistic. Altruism is an important thing. Now we will come to another point, and this is the human capital. If we look at the human capital in a way as we already now showed, then, uh, and as is said in this uh, state of the human development, people are the real wealth of nation. So now if you want to do something really very good, then you should, uh, of course, uh, have uh, human beings. So human beings are people, you can take now an extreme uh, exploiter's view, the best area to be exploited. Now a comment on exploitation, a lady who was assistant uh, to John Maynard Keynes was actually at one point even proposed for the Nobel Prize but never got it because at that time it was still a macho world. She said that the only thing worse than being exploited is not to be exploited. And I can tell you that this is really so. I personally felt uh, very badly when I was not exploited. When I was in a parliament, for instance, I was not exploited at all. And I felt very miserably. So being exploited is definitely a very good, uh, good uh, thing. Now we come to a, one of the most intriguing uh, questions. And let me again, as I did in the first lecture, draw parallel with uh, physics. As you know, it took humankind several millennia to develop ordinary measures like meter, second, kilogram, and so on. Because these measures started already in ancient India, China, Mesopotamia, and Egypt. Okay? But it was only at the time of the French Revolution that we got them standardized. So look, this was a period of millennia. Okay? Now, how do we stay in economics? In economics, basically, we decided to use gross domestic product introduced by a Bielorussian who actually emigrated to the United States by name Simon Kuznets, 
who is actually, I believe, the third recipient of the economic uh, uh, Nobel Prize. And he introduced that, and when he introduced it and spoke in front of the U.S. Congress, then he said, you know, this is a bad measure, but it is the only measure I can propose. You know. And that famous sentence kept coming on and on. It was repeated by Jan Tinberger, who is the first recipient of the Nobel Prize. Then it was repeated by Bobby Kennedy in his last speech before being assassinated. He said, this is a lousy measure. But, uh, you know, Kennedy did not say this is the only one. But he clearly said, this is a stupid thing. We don't want to do this, but still we are stuck to that. Then there are improvements to that. One improvement is the famous Human Development Index, developed by SAND, uh, Mabudu Haq, and so on, and they published this Human Development Report. And Human Development Report, for those that don't know, uses uh, uh, GDP as one third of the weight, then uses literacy, but they, as opposed to us in the World Academy, that thought that the higher education is the essential point, they concentrate on literacy and therefore now really contribute uh, because now we have almost all countries more or less literate. So they squeezed, uh, reduce this and uh, they uh, use also the health data essentially measured again by rather crude uh, measures and again that didn't do very much. Then there is a study uh, invited by uh, President uh, Sarkozy, where he asked Stiglitz, Sen, and Vitussi, and they published this work. And here, just to show you, Human Development <laughs> Index is given in uh, the first uh, uh, column, and this is ranking. And you see that Germany is ranked number five, and Serbia, for instance, in this group, uh, has 64, Montenegro is 52, Russian Federation is 55, <laughs> and so on. Then you have the difference between the Human Development uh, Index and the Gross National Income, and uh, you see that uh, there are differences here. Germany moves, actually. Austria also moves, and you see moves by 10 points down. This moves by uh, 5 points in the opposite direction. And then the purpose here is to clearly show the effect of the inequality. Now, there are various ways to measure inequality. One standard way is using the index developed by an Italian, uh, by the Gini, and so it's called the Gini Index. And uh, actually what you do, you measure the departure in percentages from the so-called uh, uh, totally perfect distribution. And you see, for instance, here the Russian Federation departs by... 40%, Croatia by 33%, uh, Montenegro by 45%, and this has an effect on uh, inequality corrected human development, uh, uh, human development index. And you see that the effect for Croatia, for instance, is 15%. Uh, there are no knowledge about the effect uh, on Russian Federation, they didn't do it. Uh, uh, for Serbia and Montenegro, it's a smaller effect, uh, but anyway. Now, besides that, there are other ways uh, of happening. The most famous one is uh, the Kingdom of Bhutan, where the King of Bhutan introduced the happiness index, and then there is a so-called modification of this life satisfaction, which goes from uh, 10 being highest and 0 being lowest. And then, as you see, uh, Germany and Austria are fairly high, uh, uh, and uh, some other countries are reasonably low. Now, the trouble, of course, of all of that, as opposed to GDP, is that GDP is something that you get every quarter, you get the data. Quickly, the data are not correct, but you know what you are getting. Uh, life satisfaction is a very subjective index, and you really don't know where you are. Okay, but this is not all. Gary and I published a paper which uh, was published in Calpus, so now is four years uh, old. It's, uh, the acronym is H-E-W-I, if I correctly remember. We, over there, you can look uh, 
How does it compare with GDP? How does it compare with human development index and so on? So, okay. Now, in all, uh, what we did is we made an effort actually to address uh, several things. One thing which we tried to include was education. And I purposely use the word try to because, uh, you know, you have to make a choice. You have to see what, what is it there. Uh, a typical case of education is composed of GDP. In the case of GDP, what do you do? You measure economic activity. So you measure what people have done, let's say, during uh, the first half year of uh, uh, 2014. In the case of education, uh, if you measure, for instance, the number of the PhD, then you are an in integrating an effect of 20 years of the education of that person. If you look uh, on the opposite side, the number of people enrolled this year, let's say, at the university, you totally forget uh, or overlook the question of how many of them will drop out. So on. So there is a lot of problems, and it's absolutely not uh, not clear. We made one choice, and uh, that was it. Similarly, of course, we try to look at uh, at the question of employment, which we believe is a very important indicator. And as a matter of fact, we published a paper on employment, and uh, that paper was accepted by the Club of Rome, and then was there presented at the Berlin conference. So I'm just saying that not to advertise our work, but rather to say that this was one of the humble attempts to bring some of the additional information. We left a number of things out, of course. Then there was a paper by the group uh, uh, involving uh, University of Cambridge and uh, the Economist Economic Unit, and I think the group in Australia, led by Sir Partadas Gupta under the name of Inclusive Wealth Report, and that came in 2012, where he, of course, again includes human, natural, and manufactured capital. Now, there is an enormous effort in trying to measure natural capital. I think our friend who will join us, uh, Ian uh, Johnson, particularly at the time when he was the vice president of the World Bank, uh, uh, was concerned with the measurement of the natural capital. Still, Boss uh, Das Gupta and his collaborator, one of his collaborators, is a fellow of uh, the World Academy, and he spoke at our conference in Trieste. Ananta Durapaya are very much working on the natural capital. But let me now show you and concentrate on the human capital. Personally, uh, and I will show you their data, I'm not sure how they measure human capital. I have serious misunderstanding of, of how do you measure human capital. Because it's such a very important thing. And as you will see in the next uh, figure, which has been published in their extensive report, but also has been published by economists in 2012, here are the data. United States, in the year 2008, had 117.2 trillion dollar of the inclusive capital. Out of that is 75 percent is a human capital. For the UK, 88 percent is the human capital. Now these are huge numbers. So if you make small errors there, uh, you uh, totally, you know, I mean. Where are we? And now the question is, what is the human capital? Uh, I would personally like to include health, education, freedom, cooperation, and activity. But this is what I would like to, and I don't know how to measure that. Uh, when you read, for instance, the recent uh, think it was interview with Stephen Hawking, uh, Stephen Hawking said, you know, if you are not healthy, and my God, he is definitely not healthy. Uh, but if you select uh, your activity, you can still be very, very good at uh, useful and happy. And he, by all standards, is. I mean, he's a famous scientist, world-renowned. His personal life uh, seems to be at least uh, 
something uh, meaningful. He had a wife who actually kept him going on, I believe three children, then decided to divorce her, marry another one, and then divorce that one as well. So, you know, I mean, uh, so health is a, 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 a component, but is not, and even to that extent, you know, I mean, he's, uh, he cannot move, he cannot speak, uh, it's really extreme health, but even in this condition you do. So it seems to me that possibly these others are maybe even more important, that uh, education, freedom, obviously he is free, activity, these are very, very important things. So the question of the human capital for me is an essential one and obviously what is happening now is uh, I think we are deliberately destroying human capital and not aware of terrible consequences. If we look at any of these segments we can say that uh, Situation with health is obviously something that we don't know how to really provide all health services for this huge amount of population in view of the fact that health cost is skyrocketing. And this is more or less everywhere. From the United States that even did not have a general health insurance uh, to my country or Montenegro or Bosnia or anyone, it's really not good. Education has been our subject all the time, and I think we, I mean, in our last talk that Roberta said, we said, look, I mean, uh, we concentrate on the future, nobody looks, uh, or we concentrate on the past, nobody looks at the future. We are obviously giving, under the best of the circumstances, half of the education. You know. The question of freedom, the question of cooperation, for instance, is obviously suppressed by too much emphasis on competition while we clearly know that the importance of cooperation is, uh, is, uh, is very much. Okay, then of course uh, the things that we know is how to, there was in nature, there was the assessment of uh, natural capital, which I'm not sure how good it is, and of course the other story, and Gary was speaking many times about that, there is an enormous amount of wealth that circulates that is not uh, connected with the real GDP and this factor of 10 larger. So this is really a serious question. This is the data that you find uh, from uh, the paper of Das Gupta and his collaborators uh, where you have the human capital, this is this uh, orange, uh, and the change, this is the change. And you see that in some countries like Nigeria, Saudi Arabia and Russia, the, human, the natural capital is actually being destroyed. But coming back to this thing, where, for instance, Russia has a very low human capital, we do know that Russia is the only country <coughs> where the male uh, expectancy, life expectancy is dropping rather than increasing. Female stays, but male is uh, seriously dropping. I think they are now what below 60, right? I mean, which is nobody else in the world has that, you know. So During Gorbachev, it raised. During Gorbachev, it raised, and then it went down. Now, during Gorbachev, uh, uh, I don't know, but I would uh, like to think that actually increase in something like the freedom and cooperation had this positive effect. And uh, so a, a number of things, you know, are, are there. Okay, now the question of the opinion poll of the last uh, year concerning the situation, the economic situation, as you see in general, are very negative, very negative. The other question is, which is very negative, and I will come to that later on, uh, last year 71% of the people considered government to be bad and uh, really inadequate. And the governance is a very, very serious uh, problem. Let me uh, read uh, from the book that has recently been published by one of our uh, fellows. The book in many ways is uh, good and in many ways is controversial. I mean, he's uh, strongly arguing for uh, 
world government uh, and then goes to things like arguing for uh, global constitution and so on. Let me, so there are things immediately when he tries to be specific, he ends in controversies, of course, which is natural. Uh, but let me say what I think is good there. What he puts uh, forward is he goes, departs very strictly from the position started, I, I would say, essentially at the time of Richelieu, under the basic slogan, raison d'etat. Namely, it was the state that was reason of everything, existence and so on. You, would, you are supposed to give your life for your country. Okay? Now what he argues is that now it should be raison de humanité. Therefore, the humanity is this, arguing that the first devotion we have are the human beings. Then the second thing that is worthwhile, since we speak so much about education, is a part where he says uh, that 15 years ago, when he was asked by his students whether they should go into politics, and of course, knowing, because even at that time there were these numbers, Politicians are considered by the general public, public to be crooks, in general incompetent, incompetent and dishonest. So he said my recommendation to my brilliant students was not to be in politics. But now I think the things have changed. And why he thinks uh, that I changed? But I changed my mind. After having had many additional opportunities to observe firsthand the hot corridors of power and thinking a lot both on politics and on humanity, and on humanity and its future, I reached the conclusion that in that developing an improved type of politician, what I now call an avant-garde politician, is essential for the future. Now, okay, then there is a big question, how do you make an avant-garde politician? And there, of course, uh, I would say that uh, what he proposes uh, it's not that easy. Of course we know and have witnessed from the time of Plato on, you remember the Plato's idea of uh, scholars, uh, scientists and so on. So this is certainly not, uh, not uh, an easy thing, but it's uh, that. Uh, we were discussing the question of the market and democracy and, of course, in many papers, uh, particularly in the Club of Rome, we have pointed out many failures of the market. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the ecological footprint is the consequence of the market. The enormous unemployment is a consequence of the market. On the other hand, the market has uh, several advantages over democracy. It uh, doesn't have uh, the, the problem of majority or minority. You are there. Do whatever you wish, regardless of that. So uh, it also has this feature of the virtual, which may be very important. Just let me tell you, I mean, we all, you all know that uh, little bit of mathematics, and you know how much mathematics is enriched by using imaginary numbers. And you can do a number of realistic calculations with imaginary numbers. So virtual situations are, by all means, uh, a, a virtue. These are all of the other things. Now, of course, uh, very often the question of uh, economy is very much linked uh, with the question of energy. We have the problem of energy by all means. Uh, the energy that is dominant now, the sources of energy that are dominant now, are either highly polluting, like fossil, or very dangerous, or we perceive them as very dangerous, like fission, nuclear. Uh, what would be a good solution would be fusion, nuclear, and it would be any of the renewables. Okay? And there is this uh, categorizing uh, of the energy sources made by the Russian physicist Kardashev, and he said that the lowest type of civilization is one that uses all Earth's resources, and then the largest one is the one that would be using galactic resources, which would be always in our power, but at the moment we are not even using all of the, all of the Earth. 
Uh, here are the data, of course, uh, just to, to, to indicate some of the ecological <laughs> footprint. Uh, in 2008, it was 30% larger. Now, presumably, it's close to 50. There is a problem with the climate change, and we did show already last time the problem. The demographic transition is the reality, this is the fact. Uh, there is a phenomenon called the demographic transition introduced by our late fellow uh, Kapitza, Sergei Kapitza, son of the Nobel Prize winner Piotr Kapitza, most of that physicist. And there is a problem introduced by another of our fellow Orio Giarini called Svecchiamento. Svecchiamento is an Italian word which means uh, counter-aging. In English it means that people who now have uh, 70 years, who are 70 years old are equal to those who were 50 years old some 30 years ago because they are uh, active, energetic, and so on, with all these uh, implements uh, uh, being introduced to them, they obviously have, uh, have a lot of that. Now, when we speak about the crisis, then very often we speak about the moral crisis, and there are two quotations which I think best uh, describe that. One is by President Eisenhower, where he very clearly said that Every gun made, he has no doubt about that. Preparation for war, the famous Latin uh, uh, proverb, civis pats and parabellum, is wrong. You don't do that. You are morally incorrect when you prepare for war. This was done by a person who was a general, okay, who is really a victor of, uh, over, over Nazi Germany, okay, so he pointed out that this is really a problem. And of course, another is from the person who founded the Club of Rome, Peche, who said that to ensure the development of humankind, it is necessary to banish war and military and non-military violence. So what are we talking here? We are talking here about the need for a profound paradigm change. Because making guns... We have seen uh, uh, Giannani showed us uh, two movies describing war. One was the war of the Romans against the German tribes. Good war. Okay. The other was Henry V uh, defeating at the Battle of Agincourt the French. Of course, their guns, or whatever it was at the time, played a very important role. As a matter of fact, in the case of the Battle of Agincourt, the crossbow was important. It was important even in the battle, previous Battle of Crecy, and so on. Uh, in all of these cases, it required an enormous economic input in, to just build this, so it was not easy. War was considered to be a solution of human problems. It has been argued that the Second World War was the solution to the big crisis of the 1930s. I don't want to go into that because this is past. I want to go into the future and I ask you the question, would war solve our problem that we still have in the economy? And my definite answer is no. War is just not going to do us anything. Would building any of these things, Star Wars, anything, be useful? The answer, in my opinion, is not. Now, of course, we are thinking still in a system of the earth where we have potential enemies who are other human beings. Might be an interesting story to contemplate what if Martians, quote unquote, I mean, we know that there is no life on Mars, but some other Martians from some other galaxy or even from some other uh, universe come here, can we meaningfully uh, really defend ourselves? Uh, I would tend to doubt, because if they are capable of coming here, and we are certainly not capable of going there, then they are technologically superior. So it would be the fight of, uh, let's say, uh, 
Henry the Fifth's uh, army fighting against uh, uh, Field Marshal uh, uh, Guerrian's tank that would not work properly. You know. So it seems to me that if we are faced with them, uh, the technological superiority is on their side. And uh, uh, if anything, biological aspects could be the worst uh, component in our possible struggling with them. So I suggest we, at the moment, concentrate on the problems that we have here and problems that we have on the Earth are essentially 90% human-made. And I think we should try to concentrate on them and the basis of the of the moral crisis is uh, let us improve uh, as much as we can uh, the human capital because this is the greatest reservoir we have. This is what made us to go from the Stone Age to this uh, to this uh, uh, part uh, here. And there the question is what is the role of uh, politicians? And there I agree with what Dor wrote. Uh, it's easy to dismiss them as being uh, uneducated and dishonest and incompetent, but sooner or later, whatever you do, is uh, there is a group of people who are supposed to make a decision. Uh, can we go to a full democracy? We are trying, thinking about that, where decisions will be made by a democratic process involving everybody, though Presumably, Winston could correctly tell us that the example of referenda, uh, where there are many referenda, for instance, like in Switzerland and in the state of California, did not work very well. I mean, we don't have experience how to do this, so that may or may not necessarily be, be good. There is a famous uh, Chinese saying that says, uh, makes a category of who are the best kings, uh, and, uh, concludes by saying that those you don't know about who are not doing anything are about the best things. We had a recent joke in Croatia that the best things that the Croatian government could do would go on vacation because then they would do the least damage. And, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of truth in that. I mean, if all of these guys would be on vacation, we would not have the problem in the Ukraine or the problem in the ISIL or anything like that, you know. Imagine all of them being on a Crimea, having a wonderful time eh, on, the, on the Black Sea would be better than they trying to run the world because they do it so incompetently. But of course, this is not so because somebody else would then do this and make wrong decisions and so on. There is a question also of an enormous bureaucracy that uh, does uh, a number of these things. So this is what I wanted to say on this subject, which, as I said, you can read much more in those things that Gary and I published, and much more and much more relevant from the economic point of view would be said, uh, I guess, uh, this afternoon you speak, right? Uh, or, uh, tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. 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 And, and, and I today. have a lot of more about uh, yeah. on Saturday. On Saturday. Yes. So, so this will be time. Okay. So that's it. Thank you very much. For that. Thank you. Maybe I could start, you know, just with a few uh, uh, comments. I was really glad you brought up. It was nice to look back at some of that earlier work. In fact, uh, uh, we did. <laughs> So the other work we well, did. I remember that uh, your first formulation of a formula for uh, you know human capital. development and human capital came out of our meeting in India in 1999, and you kept thinking about it and brought it back and have conceptualized it. Uh, I have a question, a, a thought, and a question on that, and then I want to just a brief comment on the indexes too, and see how it relates to what we're doing now. Um, to what extent in that formulation of which I'm at least a, an appreciative uh, part of it, a quarter. well, uh, I give you the credit for the inspiration which you deserve, but to what extent, I'm just reflecting on it in the view of the discussions we had today, to what extent have we 
does it reflect uh, the tremendous power of the subjective factor? I think I see education is there and freedom is there, and that reflects what uh, Alberto said, uh, because he's essentially been speaking about the conditions in which we are empowering people to bring out their potential. So I think we got a part of it. I don't, I'm not, I don't know whether there's uh, uh, some other element that could go into that uh, formulation, but it's a first, a great first attempt. Also, I'm wondering, in regard to the discussions that uh, we had after his big paper, uh, I don't think we spelled out the social capital too much. We put it in there as a, yeah. as a variable. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. But, uh, and that's my purpose. But I think, you know, one of the, it, we were, I asked the question to big when he was, after his presentation, uh, what's the difference between society and the network? Uh, or um, the market and a network, and we had a brief discussion on it. Uh, and I've been thinking about it since then. I don't say I have the answer. But I think society, and Alberto's, it's very interesting when you listen to him, he really understands that the basis of all human development, wealth, and welfare is, human, is positive human relationship. And one way to think about it is that society, which is very big and complex, is relatively unorganized. It, and when you see a network, I mean, like the Internet, which is a very sophisticated network, you see the potential for the increasing organization of those groups. Society is only relationships, some formal, some informal. But now we have a way to measure, or at least to conceptualize, the potential for increasing the density and complexity uh, of those relationships, and those of you who are network scientists know how to describe that uh, in, in terminology much better than I do. So I'm just wondering also if we revisit uh, this formula, uh, whether we could estimate the potential, you know, I don't know, conceptually, the potential for increasing the effectiveness of human relationships in terms of the number and density and types of interactions we have. It's just a thought. I don't. The second thing, uh, going back to what uh, Roberto was talking to us about uh, anticipation, in our effort uh, to introduce education as a factor in measuring, uh, you, we did a couple of things. Uh, in, in our attempt to measure progress in, in non -GD, strictly GDP terms. The first one we said is, what are we really trying to measure? We're not trying to measure just economic activity. We're trying to measure human welfare, human economic welfare. So we tried to take out those aspect, attributes of GDP that are not connected directly to uh, improving human welfare, or maybe actually in the other uh, the direction. If we're polluting our environment and then spending a lot of money to undo that pollution, uh, Increase GDP. Uh, it's, it's increasing GDP. And of course, the proverbial one, if you dig holes in the ground and then fill them up, you're increasing GDP. But you may not be doing... So we try to focus more on that which actually benefits human beings, which is not easy. But the other thing we did was we really did try to take into account the future. Because when it came, if you think about how education is handled uh, in, econ in measuring economic progress, ec education is an expenditure. Whether I expend my money on making weapons or fighting wars or putting out forest fires or educating people, it's an expenditure, whereas a human capital approach would really be, and that's what we argue, to recognize there's a difference between uh, putting out a forest fire, filling a hole, and educating a person, because you are creating capital. And any business would know that you don't account for uh, a, 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 an expenditure on capital uh, you don't ex account for it as a, a revenue expenditure, it's an investment. And moreover, we try to argue, I don't say that our solution was very elegant or precise, but we tried to argue, this is an investment which, unlike 
a capital investment in technology which rapidly depreciates over the future. This is an investment which appreciates with time. And so if you take two countries, for example, or two groups, and one of them spends their money on revenue expenditure and the other one spends their money on education, you would, you're investing in the future, which means when you measure your development now, you should take into account, you were talking about discounting the future because of the uncertainty. Well, we can be very certain, and the data is quite certain, that if we spend more on education now, we're going to be better off in the future. So what's the opposite of discounting in uh, economics? Uh, Compound. Huh? Compound. That we should actually reflect an investment in, expe- in education now as enhancing, fu- enhancing present welfare because we are ensuring, doing all we can to ensure that the future is better. So I think it's, I'm giving it as, not that our index was anything great, it was a very interesting effort, exercise, but I'm trying to illustrate how the the topic of anticipation can even go into the way we're measuring uh, uh, in in economics and in other fields. Uh, And I think the more we can identify these practical applications, uh, the more clear it will be that fundamentally, by not taking into account the future, we're really grossly distorting uh, our view and, of course, distorting the decisions uh, that we make. What else? Um, I, I have to say, many years ago, I was very curious and investigating a lot in these uh, indexes uh, as a researcher, and I always uh, in the beginning, I thought uh, there could be a lot into that. But what I miss, uh, actually, it, it is, I think, a good framework as a beginning, the framework of measures uh, that you proposed uh, and gave an overview which basically is used by you well, as I uh, could realize. Uh, but a lot of this is primarily at the individual level. So we, we don't have really this uh, relationship and then we have trust and all these I would say social categories that we miss here. It seems very individualistic on one hand. Uh, the other thing that you pointed at the end, and I think this is a good uh, bridge to see, to try to see what is in between. And this is the question of moral crisis. So the question of moral, moral crisis. Ah, moral crisis. And the <clears throat> and the issue of war, of course. And what I find in between uh, is actually. Uh, First, uh, we have to realize what are the seeds of conflicts and wars. And I think, uh, just, I would say, in this sense, bluntly mentioned the issue of inequality is not enough. Uh, it is one of the issues, but uh, one, one of my areas of research, and this is where I ta- try to find actually the sources of problems that we actually face in a large scale, and that are actually the threats or big uh, conflicts that may arise. Um, the long-term injustices, and uh, on a psychological level, what we see, the issues, which may be social or politically uh, embedded, that actually rise, um, I would say, internal, um, how to say, uh, uh, internal, Jealousy, uh, internal aggression, internal dissatisfaction, internal uh, potential to react strongly. And uh, this, this is very hard to maybe touch upon now directly, but I realize, uh, for example, just to give a I think very, uh, maybe, um, level, uh, very superficial example. What I see, for example, as a migration from African countries now is primarily this view they have. Most of these people have uh, a clear view uh, through the media what ideal life in the West looks like. And this is the drive. At the same time, uh, it doesn't uh, give them a chance. They are not given a chance. They are shown something, they are given a picture of something 
which may look ideal. And at the same time, it produces in them their dissatisfaction with their, with their own life. And there is a strong move on migration, not to go into issues of should we allow migration overall without borders, and so on. But actually, the issue is uh, there is no respect. And this is my, uh, so there are two actually lines that I see crucial. I, I was trying to work out that actually maybe it would be interesting that I presented. It was a kind of a small presentation after my PhD. There are two lines. One is uh, a little bit different understanding of power and the dimensions, the problems of power in uh, societies and in between societies. And uh, the other one of values, but in this sense of values, how we should actually respect the values of the other. And those values, for example, in the case of uh, Africa, uh, there are, I would say, different philosophies of how they understand human beings, of how they understand life, that, uh, that uh, we can hardly still appreciate uh, without better knowledge in the West to actually try to give a chance. I would say more spiritual values, more values of the nature, and uh, different values that actually are the sources of their life in those countries. They may be far from material values, and all this conceptualization from the beginning, how it started, of course, it gives a chance, but I still miss a large part, is that uh, we are trying to base it on the understanding of economy of how is it being created theoretically in the West. And here, the main line is the material value. And uh, my question is basically, did we in the West reach the, the level of that we actually satisfied the material needs. And uh, we need to go beyond that on one hand. On the other hand, we need to see the material needs of the others and to see the values of the others, which I think still are quite different in some ways and we are still not fully aware of which are these. So, uh, deep injustices, the problem of power, uh, involves uh, and uh, it goes together with this other uh, question of values, and I tried to make, uh, make a bridge, maybe as I said to whoever in the presentation, is uh, the recognition of the other. And it is a big process which actually gives a chance to overcome inequalities. Uh, it is a Hegelian idea of uh, uh, constituting one's own identity through recognizing the other. My idea was that the other, recognizing the other, is in its own values and the values of the other. We have, we have to be fully aware, try to understand, and then, of course, respect and appreciate. Uh, and this is, I think, what is missing, because we always produce the seeds of conflict unless we really try to understand the other. And I think the position still of the West, I'm not saying this is wrong, I'm just saying that we miss a lot into that. And I think coming to the end of moral crisis, it just shows that in between there is a huge gap that we still have to do. Thank you, Sasha. I think I need to add a very brief comment on, on the relation between, between material and, and, and uh, development, human development. Um, I found a very interesting concept, it's not a new concept, it's introduced in 1975, as I remember, by Richard Easterlin, and that Easterlin paradox is well known as Easterlin paradox. So when you, when you um, follow the, the, the correlation between the material wealth and, and the spiritual wealth in a way, actually it's satisfaction with your life, there is a, a special inflection point or break, break, break point where your uh, perception of happiness uh, and your satisfaction in your life doesn't relate to the level of income you are earning each month or each year. Yes, yes, yes. So it's very interesting uh, because uh, what um, we already mentioned, there is a certain level of income which fulfills our needs and hence we don't feel uh, uh, our spiritual coherence. So it's very interesting we need to put stress on that certain point and then what's going after that, on beyond that actually. And uh, one more interesting idea worth to mention here is the uh, concept of gross national happiness introduced by Bhutan, King Bhutan. So it's also very interesting 
uh, with complex uh, uh, surveys, they are trying to, to, to record the sentiments of the population and to, uh, to, to, to create a kind of time series of that indicator just to measure. But the problem is such a great idea comes from small countries where people, where uh, guys in power can, can influence the uh, perception of people through media, through the power, and they can create the, the, the uh, or, or the whole uh, perception of the happiness. So it's pretty much anyways, more to, more to explore. Thank you. Any other question? Yes. Uh, well, I, I hope uh, uh, we will continue this uh, discussion uh, tomorrow. Uh, I will be arguing that we need to separate social capital from human capital and we will show that the link it is, but you know, I mean, <coughs> that I will show the economic interpretation. By the way, I mean, you, you almost touched this regard uh, in the sense that investing in education means expanding <coughs> capital, human capital. And exactly, we can't, in the World Bank statistics, expenditures on education are something that you can solve human capital, period. We could add probably investing in prevention health. Yeah, it's yeah. Yeah. so that we can expand. But anyway, so this is the, the, the future. The formula, very interesting. I am so pleased, you know, with your presentation, Ivo, and that it's so you are just growing like a PhD student. May I may I enroll in your class and get the PhD in economics? We need to sit down finally and write something, you know, which, uh, but, you know, I found that the sources, I, I, you know, because we had on my website, this, the sources of wealth, and <laughs> my student became professor, you know, and then, you know, anyway, you could invite them that you found that you cited. This is because I cited very uh, often, because there's that misperception that the wealth of the United States does not come from the natural resources. Well, most of course, yeah. people, yeah. you know, me, yeah. comes from human capital. Yeah, yeah and then it, it's always, you know, between 80 and 75 percent. Now, before, I mean, uh, so this is something very, very important to, to understand the role of the human capital. Yeah, 75 percent comes from Yeah, 70, yeah, yeah, exactly. So anyway, uh, the formula, this is something quite, the, the formula assumes that you will explain the complete uh, substitution different form of capital leading to complete elimination one of them. Yeah, the social capital. So I mean from that point of view, I mean this is we call it in, the, in economics, in uh, environmental economics particularly a type of weak sustainability. But we have also strong sustainability when we put limits on substitution. And this is something that I will be talking uh, during the last uh, day. And uh, then, you know, the, the new stuff is, and then, you know, I, after your presentation, I decided to include to, to my present Saturday presentation, because I was from the beginning uh, of uh, uh, birth of the new social progress index, which is very unusual uh, collaboration between three prominent American universities, MIT, Harvard, and Columbia, plus economists joined. It's one more prominent institution. So, Michael Porter uh, became the chairman of the council representing all these parties, and they, they presented to the United Nations, I guess, a year ago, but, you know, I, I, I saw this first, you know, he presented to our the, the affiliated faculty in December uh, to, uh, 2012, you know, and then in group version uh, last December. So, it's very interesting, you know, and uh, I, you know, I, I, I will talk about it. I will include this in my presentation, which I originally in the plan. You will see what are the elements, you know, you raised here, several of them. Included. So that there are in general idea is this is the complement because the GDP is so popular. Even you know without this, you know you cannot 
Everybody knows that this is a week, but you know, it's so common. Everybody is so not fine with the horse, you know, be smart and then put the compliment. Look, you know, this is in the compliment much better, you know, and gives much better information. So, this is something the social, in, uh, 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 in the social, social uh, progress index uh, based on Martin uh, Sen uh, and uh, North and uh, Stiglitz work uh, before. So, you will find also some issue of Mura uh, uh, the opportunities, for instance, of development. You know, not internal stuff, we were talking very difficult to measure the level of satisfaction, and so there are three groups of indicators. So, uh, so we are moving forward to, 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 to better measure the, the social progress and, and, and the role of economic development. And this is very important uh, contribution uh, you made, and uh, I hope we, we will work on this. But amazing negative effects to do not realize with the gap in the distribution, with the poor distribution of income on wealth. So this is something what is the type of warning signal, and then. We saw two weeks ago this riots in Ferguson. It's a, an example. This is not just, you know, a coincidence. This is the, this is the tree in the forest, you know, so there's much more, uh, we expect, you know, might happen, you know, if we do not address this. It's very difficult. And the, the political system to raise the issue, but, uh, uh, uh this is important. So, environmental, uh, social uh, issues and uh, the opportunities for the political system which gives you. And the depressing case, really, the, the Russia, uh, uh, which has more engineers than the United States, performs so quickly in terms of human capital. So, it's mainly economic driven by natural resources. Thank you. Uh, any more? Okay, then I will comment on uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, things as much as I can. Let me start with uh, uh, comments by Big and uh, Gary. Uh, of course, uh, what uh, this formula says is, as I said very clearly, Psi is a combination of uh, human and social capital. And that is, of course, beautiful when you write the formula, uh, but it has many, many problems, okay? Uh, because the two are interconnected, but yet different. Okay, so this is the problem number one. Problem number two, as I said, but uh, try to be honest, but maybe I wasn't, uh, when I showed, uh, when I showed uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this graph, I said, this is the measure of uh, uh, this combination of the capital. It's not really, because what we have reduced ourselves to is just the GDP per capita. This is one very, very narrow aspect. We were thinking what else could we do. For instance, we could plot the life expectancy. And the curve would be the same, because throughout the history, the life expectancy was about 20, then it went to about 40. This all flat period, just like here, from 1000 to essentially 1800, uh, life expectancy would be the same. Then it went up now, and now it's up to about 80, and now is increasing with three months uh, per year increase. But by the way, most of that is due to ordinary things like washing your hands. Let me pause here, let me pause here and give you a health warning. Uh, some of you have not heard, but due to the very bad uh, uh, rain we had uh, two days ago, uh, and all of the water that Dubrovnik gets, gets from this uh, underground river which comes uh, a little bit north of here called Ombla, it has been, the spring has been really totally 
polluted by a number of things. So if you look at, if, if you read the newspaper or listen to the radio, which I doubt that most of you do because you don't read the language, you don't understand the language, it is not a good thing to wash your hands. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, with this water. I'm right? afraid to ask you what has been polluted. Yeah, no, no, it's polluted with heavy elements, yeah, apparently some dirt, and I don't know, is really to the level of being dangerous. So you see, you have to really now, uh, yesterday when we were coming, we bought huge amount of uh, bottle waters, each one. Which was selling at a premium price to you. Well, two days, I've been drinking the water because I, when I drank at the Dallas in the USA, to drink the water. Uh -huh. it, it was and before, was. yeah. And only two days later, I discovered it wasn't. So, yeah. uh, I was saying to Winston, what does that imply? That is South African or African water was just yeah. Impact on the <laughs> it did that must have an effect. Okay, so you are strong. Okay, but I mean, I don't know. Uh, basically, when I was talking to the person in uh, in the hotel, they said, "Look, you can shower, but don't brush your teeth, uh, don't drink." Uh, and uh, as I said in this uh, argument about water, you know, washing your hands, which is in general very positive, now basically. You come to the different story. So, how to make a good uh, variable describing human capital and social capital and to combine them is not easy. Gary and I were pondering and finally said, okay, this is the simplest one. Most people don't know it. Everybody knows about life expectancy and it would follow the same thing. We also thought of how about putting discoveries, okay? That's again not quite an, uh, an honest indicator because now we have many more people, as you see, it's exponentially increasing. Obviously now there are more scientists than ever in, uh, in the world. As a matter of fact, the story is that all of the science, scientists who ever lived are, uh, I mean, 80% of scientists who ever lived are still alive. You know, I mean, it's a stupid statement, but a correct statement. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, it seems that you're saying if we can't have the most accurate, uh, accurate measurable indicators of human capital, then the concept is wobbling. Yes. And yeah. What I want to know is, is measurement the only way in which you can rationally impute meaning to the concept of human capital or the other methods of human capital? This is a very important question. I think we have become, uh, particularly in the 20th century and now, victims of measurements. You see all the measurement, 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 and the question is, what does the measurement mean? And if it is not clear, you might be get, getting wrong information. Personally, I think that a lot, lot of the information based on GDP uh, has been overdone, and this enormous tendency to uh, uh, this uh, frugality and so on is not the right way to do. So yes, and, and these are these are some of the, of the deep questions. I also personally have enormous reserve the, with respect to the work of Esterling and all of these things measuring the life satisfaction uh, and all of that. As a matter of fact, okay, let me tell you a personal story how I became a murderer. Uh, I became a murderer in the following way. I got this on the email, this Happy Planet Index. So you can sort of uh, calculate whether you are satisfied with the Happy Planet. So I did that. I'm not, I'm not smoking. I'm not doing that. I really minimally used the car. And everything was going great until there was an item asked, your intercontinental flights. Then I became a murderer. Why? Because it tells you, you know, then it flashes the bubbles, gives you, uh, due to your behavior, uh, so many people have been, have been killed, period. I mean, I'm almost on a level of being like uh, Stalin and Hitler, mass murderer, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, same <laughs>
So this is why, of course, in the World Academy we try to do many, many things via, uh, via emails and things like that, you know, trying to reduce that. But no, this is, this is a serious question. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not uh, that, uh, that, that trivial how, how to do uh, these things. What I personally <laughs> like, uh, yes? We know that these are you use the method of narrative so that you can describe in narrative form and give it some weight, you know. Uh, and, and those that don't lend themselves to statistics provide you with a narrative to which you can describe a certain weight. Yeah, uh, precisely. I mean, this is a very deep point uh, where I think, by the way, that uh, following strictly the dictum of physics uh, uh, has been very bad for science in general. It, it is a famous statement by Kelvin who says that unless you can measure something, you should not even speak about that thing. But when you look clearly, there is a number of things we, we cannot measure. Some of them are uh, love, uh, uh, beauty, and so on. Uh, and beauty is extremely important extremely important. Wisdom is extremely important. You cannot measure how you can say this person is wiser than the other, how you can say that this person is more beautiful than the other. And these are not, uh, these are things that uh, are really non-measurable and reducing everything to non-measurable, uh, to, to measurable is doubtful. Of course, uh, putting it into a narrative is also not easy. Uh, uh, measuring is much simpler. Imagine buying uh, uh, just apples. You can do a narrative, go there and describe it, or just say, give me a pound of apples. That's much easier. She precisely does something and so on. If you go there and tell her a narrative, it will really be, be in many ways, uh, uh, problematic. But I think what I wanted, actually, from this entire uh, discussion that we had, uh, my somehow main conclusion is the most important thing is uh, the human capital. Now, uh, we have fellows in the academy, my good friend and your good friend, and many of us good friend, uh, Momir Djurovic, president of the Montenegrin Academy, who currently is on our behalf, uh, attending the conference of ICSU, said when he saw this human-centered new paradigm, he said, now, how you can say about human-centered, after all, we humans have been here for an infinitesimal uh, part of the history of uh, the, the Earth. Uh, maybe the Earth is better without us. That is perfectly possible, I mean, uh, rightly. The uh, that the, the, the Earth would be better without us. Oh, look, we are polluters. We are damaging the earth so much that it's impossible, you know. You are... No, 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 no. Gadija, Gadija really is uh, coming. Uh, you have a PhD in physics? No, no. Oh, but then you should. Uh, you should. Let me tell you, I mean, there is a simple question in physics that uh, you implicitly answer. Uh, the simple question in physics is, why is the atom of hydrogen as heavy as it is? Right? Why is it not a little bit heavier? I mean, you know, I mean, all of us have different weight, right? So why not, uh, uh, why, why should have just exactly this and not, why is the strength of gravity exactly as it is? And there is an answer, and the answer is what you gave, namely, because of the human beings. Because if anything would be changed, just by slight few percent, we human beings would not be here. So this universe is fine-tuned to our existence. And so this is the essential thing. We, we happen to live in a universe which is ours. So we are the unique one. Is it, is it quite opposite? We are fine-tuned to the... No, 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 no. universe is fine-tuned to us. All of the other... There could be billions of other universes that do not produce human beings. But this one yeah. is tuned to produce us. If we uh, are pollutants. I'm sorry? It's quite different if we are pollutants. 
No, no, no. But regardless of, of we being pollutants, you know, we can destroy this universe. We are doing our best to destroy it, uh, but the physical constraints of the universe are such that this universe sooner or later produces humans. It took them uh, whatever, five billion, uh, I mean, uh, uh, 13 billion years to produce us, but it produced us eventually. Sorry, are you saying fine to humans or fine to us? Um, no, to humans even. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, a number of things, uh, you know, because we are, in a way, special uh, human beings. Of course, the first thing is that the universe is uh, really conditioned to produce life. But the question is whether this life uh, would end uh, somewhere on a level which would not develop its richness through the evolution. And this richness of evolution, again, requires very careful balance of, for instance, uh, oxygen and nitrogen and so on. As we know, there, are, uh, uh, there is life in conditions, let's say, uh, that have a very huge amount of nitrogen and so on, where we as human beings could not live, right? Uh, so the whole thing actually, essentially, brings us uh, to, to human being, and uh, the universe is very fine-tuned. As a matter of fact, this is known as an anthropic principle. Now, the anthropic principle, physicists don't like, because, I mean, uh, uh, if it would be the only thing, you know, because it would be almost uh, a proof of God. And uh, since you cannot prove God by definition, then, uh, then we found a way out. And the way out is to say we are just one of billions of universes. These other universes are different from us, and there are no human beings in them. And the big thing would be to go from one universe to the other, which we can do through the wormhole, if this works. But again, well, you know they all have the living beings on? No, no, no. Okay. We don't know that there are living and most likely there are no living beings on any one of them. So you have a choice. Either you believe in God or you believe in yeah. billions of uninhabited yeah. universes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, so this is, you know, whatever you want. Yeah. Is there an exact answer to that? I don't think there's an exact answer to that. What? To yeah, answer? Do you think that there's uh, 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 living beings on other planets in the universe? No. Oh, uh, no, you are, uh, there are several questions that you ask. One question is, are there, human, are there some kind of human beings on other planets in our universe? There is a formula written by Drake who actually takes account of how many stars how many of these stars have uh, planets around them yeah. and how many of them have the conditions similar to our Earth. When you calculate all of that, uh, that number is fairly large. So you would say if there is such a large probability, yes, there is somewhere life besides us. This opens a number of moral, uh, theological questions and so on. But our situation now is, A, we have not encountered them. There is a very intensive search under the, the program SETI, uh, which is extraterrestrial life, uh, trying to find them. So far, we have not found anyone. What we know is that uh, uh, to our close neighborhood, uh, there is nothing which has another part of the story, linked, by the way, in the history of the Academy, to one of our former presidents uh, who actually wanted to put uh, a big project, should we stay or should we go, following that, uh, that uh, song, uh, you know. Uh, the story is that this is not as simple as it was uh, for, uh, for Columbus and all of these other people who were traveling. Going outside and colonizing the universe is a tough cookie. We can't do that very easily. Our technology is... Uh, assumably quite uh, below that for quite some time. Partly because uh, while our surroundings, namely the Atlantic Ocean, was ferocious but not that bad, uh, the outer space is really very, very ferocious. Believe uh, Because I think that really goes back to what you consider is life. And I think, you know, here you also come to the kind of limitations of this sort of Newtonian world that we have moved into, where you basically only exist so we can measure sort of in a material way. 
It means you shuttle ourselves out from everything else that you would have to use totally different ways of measuring. Yeah? Like one example, you, you said love. Yeah? I mean, love is something that you can feel, you notice that it is there. You will find it pretty difficult to, for a machine to measure, to love. measure love. You, you use a different way of checking it, uh, checking its intensity and whatsoever. And I think this life, for example, is the same because basically life can originate in principle when you have a planet that's in a certain distance from the sun. So this means that the water is available in crossing. Okay, so I mean, there's a certain temperature range, you know, that, that, that it has to be. If you consider life, for example, what I do is a kind of an energy that's just not captured by physical thinking and will never be because it operates on a totally different level. So it's not sort of immediate, um, occasional kind of an incident that your atoms come together in this primal soup or whatsoever and then sort of you avoid it. No, I think, you know, you have the conditions you would have left everywhere. I mean, you see, I, I think, you know, that's, that's belief system. Uh, uh, yeah, you believe. No, it's not quite a belief system. It depends actually how do you define uh, life. Yeah. Uh, uh, certainly. Uh, but there are certain things that we all accept as being life. Life does not have to be based on carbon. It can be based, for instance, on silicon. But it cannot be based on, uh, for instance, manganese or on, uh, let's say, uh, boron or something like that. So there are only few elements that you could have that. Now, the conditions of having elements is also very much constrained because the elements are all, except the lightest one, made actually in the interior of the stars. To make them in the interior of the stars, there are certain very detailed balance between the forces of gravity, the forces of electromagnetism, and the nuclear strong and weak forces. Now, this is satisfied here. If you would change any of this, you may not have even the galaxy. I mean, it, so, so all of this is very much relevant to A, the constants that we have now determining the physical world and the laws that we have now in this physical world. On the other hand, whether we could have uh, beings that are very similar to humans, but not humans, machines, intelligent machines. That's perfectly possible. As a matter of fact, at our last conference in Montenegro, we had uh, uh, two papers dealing with the law potentially involving marriage between a human and uh, an artificial human being. How would that go? That is perfectly possible. There is a so-called Turing uh, test to say whether another being, quote unquote, is a human being or not. And the answer is if you don't see that person and communicate with that, quote unquote, person, and you cannot see whether, if you cannot conclude whether it's human or not, then that person is human, though you don't see it. When you see it, it could be a couple of wires or what it is, you know. So are we close to have something like that? Obviously not, but we are not that far. I mean, there are, of course, machines that are better chess players than... Uh, yeah, but if you go to the other side of the universe, the gravity constants would still be the same. Yes, would still be the same. So maybe life is, as a natural law, life too. Wherever you go, it's carbon based, you know? Yeah, no, it could be, yeah, absolutely. If we say now a universe, we say now a universe, we know yeah. that if there is life, uh, you know, on a very, very distant uh, star, on a planet very distant, it would be carbon-based life uh, that is possible. The question is, you know, that these people to come to us, uh, they, even if they fly at the speed of light, they need more than 10 billion years. <laughs> so how do you do that? I mean, it's... Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe our task is to find a way of putting together on the planet. Oh yeah, no, no, I will. absolutely, absolutely, this is, this is, yeah. yeah, no, no, this is why, you see, uh, uh, why we were against, politically, against this, uh, this project, should we stay or should we go, because it actually puts a wrong feeling that we can do the same, that we could do the same thing when we did 
leave Europe and go to America. We can't do that thing. This is out of question. This is uh, almost out of question. You know, it's fine to work on that, fine to dream on that, but look, let us not play, uh, uh, you know, Christopher Colombo. Yes, okay. thank you very much.